we are going to turn to the word of the Lord now. And over the last couple of weeks at our church, we've been exploring this sermon series that I have called Reasons to Believe, um, Thoughtful Answers to Common Obstacles to Faith. And we've just been looking at what are some common things that people who are maybe not believers sort of share and say when, when you ask them, well, why don't you believe in Jesus? And, and this is based a lot in my own experience talking to people about their sort of obstacles to faith. And uh, we've looked at all kinds of things, uh, you know, scientific evidence for the Creator or, you know, historical reasons to believe that the resurrection really happened and uh, why is there suffering in the world if there really is a loving God. We've sort of looked at all of these things as we've worked our way through. And today is our last sermon in that series. And after Family Sunday next week, we're starting Lent and we'll have a whole new thing to look at. But for today, for our last sermon in our series, I'm going to invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. We'll be reading verses 1 to 6. There are Bibles in the pews if you'd like to follow along, or you can just hear the word of the Lord as it's read. And let's hear what God's word says to us today. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is now dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. So some of you may know that my second favorite movie of all time is an old Tom Hanks Meg Ryan outing called Joe versus the Volcano. Anybody? I saw one, two hands, okay. Well, Joe versus the Volcano came out way back in 1990, and so that I did not expect many of you would have seen it. So I came complete with the Coles notes today to explain. You see, Joe Banks was just your average Joe. He was a timid soul slogging away at a miserable job in a medical supply company. And he was always going to the doctor because he, and I quote, he just doesn't feel good. And then one day on one of his routine visits, the doctor gives him the news that he has been waiting for. Joe has a mysterious disease, a terminal disease called a brain cloud. It's not painful, the doctor assures him. But one day, your brain will simply quit, followed abruptly by your body. And when Joe asks how long he has, the doc says, about six months. But you do have some time left, Mr. Banks. Y you have some life left. And my advice to you is to live it well. And thus begins a series of uncanny events for our hero. He promptly quits his job, sharing some <clears throat> colorful suggestions for his boss on the way out. And then the next day, a mysterious millionaire appears at his door, offering him an all-expenses-paid trip of a lifetime to a South Pacific island called Waponiwu. And all he has to do is just jump into the island's volcano when he gets there. I'll drop the details on you later, but for now, just know that Joe figures going out in a blaze of glory beats the socks off waiting it out in his dingy little apartment, and so he takes the gig. And thus begins the long and winding road to Waponiwu. Along the way, Joe gets shipwrecked, he has a spiritual awakening, and he falls in love with Meg Ryan, which in a Tom Hanks movie is kind of the same thing as having a spiritual awakening, right? 
Meg Ryan's character, it turns out, is Tom Hanks' soulmate in every sense of the word. She follows him up right to the very lip of the volcano, and she grabs his hand, determined to jump in with him. And here is the point I've been trying to get to in all of this. Because when Joe and Patricia stand on the edge of the volcano, ready to take that final terrifying leap, Patricia turns to Joe and she says, she says, Joe, nobody knows anything. We'll take this leap and we'll see. We'll jump and we'll see. That's life. They take a deep breath. <laughs> they step off the ledge. And, well, how many people have seen this movie? <laughs> if you have seen it, then you will know that what happens next is a miracle. I almost fell off the ledge myself. <laughs> Because instead of swallowing them whole, the volcano erupts at just the exact moment as they're falling and the force of the blast shoots them clear and they soar into the sky like a Roman candle on the 4th of July and they land safely in the sea while the island sinks in a plume of steam and lava and they're the only ones left alive. And you're probably wondering, what on earth does this have to do with Hebrews chapter 11? <laughs> Well, what if I told you that in one sense, Joe's story is sort of a parable for what the life of faith looks like? At least for the kind of faith that the book if, of Hebrews is describing here, it is. Because, think about it, before jumping into that volcano, all Joe and Patricia had was the hope that everything was going to be okay, right? They, they didn't know it. As Patricia said to Joe, nobody knows anything, but we'll take this leap and we'll see. And they couldn't know for sure before they jumped. But then, in the act of jumping, by taking that leap, they made their hope concrete. Because the volcano erupted just when they needed it to, and they were spit out safe and sound. Is this making sense to you? Their leap of faith made their hope tangible for them. It made it concrete in their lives. It made it real. If it does make sense, then maybe it will make sense what the book of Hebrews is saying here when it says in verse 1, it says that our faith makes our longings tangible and makes our hope concrete. Now, that is my very loose <laughs> paraphrase of the verse, mind you. What it literally says is that faith is, and I quote, it's confidence in what you hope for and assurance about what you do not see. But I'm putting it like that, that faith makes our longings tangible and our hope concrete. I'm putting it like that. Well, because I want to avoid a very common confusion that people sometimes have when it comes to Hebrews chapter 11. You see, the way it's worded there, it gives the impression that faith has something to do with being certain about the things we believe. Right? Like, like, well, if faith is confidence in what we hope for and it's assurance about what we can't see, then if I'm not 100% certain, then it can't really be faith. Right? At least I, I can't have any uncertainty, can I? Or any unanswered questions? Or, or I can't say, you know, well, I'm just not really sure about that when it comes to spiritual things. Right? actually not right. Not according to the book of Hebrews, anyways. Because if you could see it in the original language that it was written in, you would see that what verse 1 actually says is something closer to this, that faith is the evidence of things we hope for, and it's the proof of things we can't see. One of the books I was reading in my research for this sermon said it like this. For the author of Hebrews, faith gives the things that we hope for substance. It makes them real for us, and it makes them present in our lives. Faith is the 
Well, it's the spiritual equivalent of Joe stepping off the ledge of the volcano <laughs> and then getting shot out. It, it realizes our hope as we have faith. Now, I'm, I'm not just taking my time to explain all of this, you know, so that you understand why we started this morning's sermon with an extended synopsis of my second favorite movie of all time. <laughs> More importantly, I'm going into all of this because this is our fifth and final sermon in the running series that we have been doing called Reasons to Believe, right? Where we've been looking at some common obstacles that people have when it comes to faith. And if it is translated correctly, Hebrews 11, 1 to 6, gives us what for me is one of the most compelling reasons of all to believe. It's because of the way that faith makes our deepest spiritual longings tangible. Now, just bear with me for a second, because this actually touches on one of the classic arguments for the existence of God, the way that human beings seem to have this deep down longing for something more, a, a desire for something that's unseen and, and transcendent and beyond us, something that, that nothing in this world seems to satisfy. This is sometimes called the argument from desire, and it shows up all over the place once you know where to look for it. Uh, C.S. Lewis, who was the author of the Narnia books for children, he gave us the classic version of the argument for desire in a book called Mere Christianity. It goes like this, and I quote, Creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exist, he says. A baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. A duck wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. So then, he says, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, then the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, he says, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing that I'm really longing for. In other words, the longing we find in ourselves for something more a longing, a longing that gets aroused in us by things like, I don't know what it is for you, beautiful art, <laughs> a glorious sunset, a, a loving relationship. Those things cause us to long for something more because we actually were made for something more. Of course, you don't have to be a philosopher like C.S. Lewis to feel the weight of this argument. <laughs> Mothers holding their newborn babies get it instinctively. I was watching a video recently by a woman named Jennifer Fulweiler. She is a blogger and a stand-up comedian who also happens to be a devout Catholic, although she wasn't always any of those things. For most of her life, she was a staunch atheist. And in this video, she was talking about her journey from being a decidedly convinced atheist to being a deeply committed Christian. And she says the thing that got her started, asking the kinds of questions that led her to Christ, was the birth of her first child. I, I looked down, she says, and I thought, what is this baby? And I thought, well, from a purely atheist, materialistic perspective, he is a collection of randomly evolved chemical reactions. And I realized if that's the case, then all of the love that I'm feeling for him right now, that's nothing more than just chemical reactions in our brain. She says, and I looked at him, and I realized that's not true. <laughs> that's just not the truth. She says, I didn't know where to go from there. But that's what prompted me to start researching topics about spirituality. And I will send you the video if you want to find out how her research eventually brought her to the cross of Jesus Christ. But for today, just let that moment of realization sink in for you. It can't be true, she thought, 
that all of this love and longing that I feel for this little baby is, is nothing more than just random molecules colliding in a meaningless void. In his, his book, The Devil's Delusion, Atheism and Its Scientific Pretensions, the philosopher David Berlinski says it like this. And mind you, Berlinski is not a Christian himself. He is an atheist, but he's talking about the fact that there is no theory of genetic evolution that can explain why living organisms like us desire things and want things and, and are curious about things and feel things like, you know, like boredom or love or despair. And he says, he writes, we live by love and longing, by death and the devastation that time imposes. How did any of these things enter the world? And why? The, the world of the physical sci sciences is just not our world. And if our world has things in it that cannot be explained on their terms, then we must search elsewhere for an explanation. Like I say, it shows up differently for different people. <laughs> but this argument from desire, this, this deep down longing for something more, it is for me, it is one of the most compelling reasons of all for faith. Because faith, the book of Hebrews says, faith is how the things we are longing for become real to us because they are real if you happen to go through my how one man changed the world course you will know that I sometimes use this analogy to explain the argument from desire because for me it's a little bit like those those you know the guess the picture games that they used to give you when you were a kid in school Right? Do you remember these? Where the picture is all zoomed in and you can't tell what you're looking at, right? Because it's just, it's up too close, right? And you don't have the right perspective on it from where you are standing, right? And then everyone takes their shot at it. Anybody? Don't shout it out. You might know the answer. <laughs> but after everyone has made their guess, you turn the page where the picture is suddenly zoomed out at its proper perspective. And once you see it in perspective, you can see how this is really this. I just felt the ah in the room <laughs> as I turned the page, right? Or this. Any guesses? This is really this. Okay, so we all know how this works, right? But in a way, faith, at least the kind of faith that the book of Hebrews is describing. It, it, it's sort of like when we go from this, in the corner there, anybody? To, to this. It was a doorknob all along. I even gave the picture at the start so you could see it. <laughs> but okay, but like think about this. Think about your, our lives, your life right now, our, our personal stories, the, the world that we live in right now. And, and think about all that stuff, and then think about how you see it all right now. You just see it up close, right? Because you're living it right now, and it's really close. And, and sometimes it's impossible to know what to make of all this stuff. Like, like we have this nagging sense, let's say, that things like truth and justice and fairness, they matter. But, but where does that come from? And is it even connected to anything bigger than just a feeling I have in my own gut? And some things, like, like relationships maybe, or, or dreams, or ambitions that we have, they seem to be way out of proportion, you know? They're, they're like, they're way bigger than they should be. But, but if they're so important, then why don't they seem to satisfy what I'm really looking for? And some things in our lives are really blurry. I don't know about you, but they're getting blurrier for me as I get older. <laughs> it's, it's hard to focus in on them, right? I mean, is, is there something more to that longing I get when I hear a beautiful piece of music? Or that kind of stirring in my heart that comes over me when I hold a newborn baby? 
Is there anything more to any of that stuff? It, it feels like there should be. But it's, it's hard to get it into focus so that I can actually make sense of it. Are you guys picking up what I'm laying down here? <laughs> we live our lives completely zoomed in on them. And we cannot see how any of it is connected to anything meaningful, bigger, clearer, more transcendent. In faith, Hebrews says, when, 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 we be, when we believe the gospel and we commit our lives to following Jesus, that kind of faith brings all of these things into their proper perspective. And it shows us how we are, we are actually connected to something far bigger and far more beautiful than any of us ever dreamed of. Because the message of our faith is this, that the Lord Jesus Christ was executed on a Roman cross for the sins of the world, and through his death and his resurrection, God did everything that needed to be done so that our sins could be forgiven and we could live in a healed, whole relationship with him. And if we confess with our mouths that he is Lord, the Bible says, and if we believe in our hearts that it happened, that, that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And all God's people said, amen. All the things that the cross makes possible for us, right? God's grace in our lives. God's acceptance when we feel unacceptable. God's friendship and help when we are lonely and helpless. All of this and more becomes ours. I mean, talk about being connected to something more. Whitby Church, through faith in Jesus Christ, you will discover how your life is actually connected to the holy, divine, eternal life of Jesus Christ himself. And all of those things, through faith, become concrete and tangible in your life according to the book of Hebrews. <laughs> now, if it feels like I'm dwelling on this, it's only because, well, it's because we have been talking for over a month now about obstacles to faith and reasons to believe. And we've talked about all kinds of stuff, right? Scientific reasons to believe it makes sense that there is a creator. And historical reasons to believe, yeah, it makes sense that the tomb was empty. And, and all of those things are true. And I personally find them convincing, but I've also talked to enough people over the years about the reasons they don't believe to know that all of the rational evidence in the world on its own is not going to make the truth of the gospel tangible for you. And you can actually be completely convinced by all of these things, you know, believe that they are true in theory, but still not have faith the way the book of Hebrews is talking about it here. Because there is something about the life of faith that at some point, you actually have to step off the lip of the volcano, <laughs> so to speak. Right, right, right. Be before you can really know God as good, as good as the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ makes him out to be, before you can know him as that, at some point you have to take the leap and start living your life for him. The, uh, the philosopher Francis Schaeffer has a picture for this in a book called He is There and He is Not Silent. And I'm just going to close with it. And especially if you are standing on the lip of the volcano today, like you're not sure if you're really ready to take this leap or not, I do trust that this picture will speak to you. He says, Imagine that you and I were hiking in the Alps. Fra Francis Schaeffer lived in Switzerland in the Alps, so this makes sense from his context. He says, Imagine we were hiking in the Alps all by ourselves late in the day, and just as the sun is going down, a terrible fog rolls in, leaving us in total darkness. 
And, you know, we do our best to try to find our way, but before you know it, we are just groping around in the dark. And you reach this point where you can kind of reach your foot out, you know, and you can tell that you are standing on the very edge of a sheer rock face, totally blind and nowhere to go. Have you all put yourself in that spot? Now imagine I turned to you and I said, you know what, maybe... If you just dropped off the edge there into the dark, maybe there's a path down below and you'll just land safe and sound and you'll be able to find your way to safety. Who would do it? (laughs) On my speculation. I saw some hands. I see one hand. (laughs) That's a lot of of responsibility on my part, Brooklyn, but okay. (laughs) I would not do it. So we're all in good company. I would not do it. But suppose then you heard a voice calling out to you. Friends, says the voice. I know you cannot see me, but I know exactly where you are from your voices. I'm on another ridge, and I have lived in these mountains all my life. I know every foot and every crevice of them. And I can assure you, the voice says, that just ten feet below you there is a ridge, and if you would just hang and drop, you will find a path that will lead you out of the fog and down to safety. Who would drop then? I see a couple more hands, but not many. (laughs) I probably still wouldn't drop at that point, at least not right away, but I would start to ask some questions to see if this voice really knew what it was talking about. For instance, in the Swiss Alps, there are certain families that have lived in the mountains for years and years and years. And so maybe I would ask him his name. And if I recognized it as a mountain name, that would help me trust him a good deal, right? And maybe I would ask him to describe his ridge in comparison to ours. And maybe he should have to tell me how he got up on that ridge in the first place. Or maybe what does he know about that path down below, you know, so that I could start to determine whether the voice was legit, Quote, I would ask him, Francis Schaeffer says, what to me would be the adequate and sufficient questions? And only when I became convinced of his answers would I hang and drop. Adequate and sufficient answers, he says. That's what it would take. Of course eventually I would still have to decide that I was going to do it. And all of the adequate and sufficient answers in the world are not on their own going to get me off that ledge to safety. At some point, I have to step out and drop. Whitby Church, I think that's the kind of leap of faith that the book of Hebrews is asking us to take today. It's not a blind leap for no good reason. Not by a long shot, is it? And God will be patient to give you answers to all of your questions if you are asking them in good faith. But at some point, you still have to take him at his word and take the leap. But when you do, as far as the book of Hebrews is concerned, when you do, you will find your deepest longings becoming tangible and your highest hopes becoming real. I'm going to invite us to pray, and I'll ask the worship team to come and lead us as we respond to what we've heard. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the patience you show us with our groping about in the dark, looking for answers, and your willingness to meet us where we're at. May it be, Lord, that if there's someone today who is listening to these words and standing on the lip of the volcano, so to speak, that you would so graciously lead them into a life of loving and following you and make yourself real to them, we pray.